Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for um, inviting uh, me to speak today and giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'd like to give you a bit of the backstory to the Stage Zero River Restoration um, approach um, and look at the background of theory and some of the practices. And in doing so, then, uh, I'll look at uh, st the stream evolution model, which is the foundation for the idea of stage zero, the propensity for anabranching rivers to occur in nature, and then look at why um, perhaps this idea of fully reconnecting rivers to their floodplains isn't quite as radical as some people think it is. Uh, it has its roots in the theory of bankful flow uh, uh, in transport and response reaches of rivers, uh, in the theory that valley confinement plays a, a major control on river platforms and processes and environments and uh, in the concept of stable channel design. So um, that's what I'm going to try and do in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. So let's look at the background, the stream evolution model. What the heck is that? And anabranching channels in nature. Well, why should we not be surprised that, uh, that anabranching is a natural channel form? And it all goes back really to 1984 and a book published by Shum, Harvey and Watson called Incised Channels. And in this book, they looked at the causes and outcomes of channel incision um, in mostly in North Mississippi, but in other parts of the United States as well. And they put forward what they called the channel evolution model um, with these evolutionary phases where in uh, phase one, the channel is pretty stable and well behaved, doesn't change much. But in stage two, it uh, incises, it cuts into its bed. The bank heights increase such that they reach or exceed the critical bank height for uh, gravitational failures. And in stage three, the channel just blows out with the banks collapsing and the, the river sweeping away the sediment from the foot of the banks. Eventually, as the channel gets very wide, um, it starts to berm up. Material that sloughs off the banks um, collects at the foot of the channels. The channel starts to lose some of its um, increased size through aggrading and narrowing. And finally, in stage five, there's a new inset channel within the canyon now that's been cut by that phase of incision and rapid widening. And they even give a nod to vegetation here, to biology, pointing out that willows uh, trees with adventitious roots will uh, spring up on those berms and start to stabilize the banks. And that uh, idea of, of, of the channel evolution model actually got a lot of traction in the 80s and 90s and was used um, uh, in, in, in many parts of the states and across the world uh, as a template for understanding the sequence of channel changes that uh, often followed disturbance. But in 2008, a paper came out in Science that really challenged a lot of this. It was by Walter and Merritt working along the fall line of the eastern United States and looking at channels like Watts Branch and Seneca Creek and Brandywine Creek, made famous by Leopold Woolman and Miller, who used them as the bed bedrock sites um, for developing their ideas of the relationship between channels and floodplains. Now, what was revolutionary about Walter and Merritt's approach was that they noticed that the um, Holocene floodplain, the 10,000 year old or less floodplain, was buried under uh, several meters of post-settlement alluvium, such that the new floodplain actually only dated back to about 1850 and was very much the result of uh, rapid development by European and American settlers uh, forest clearance and rapid alluviation of the natural uh, valley bottoms. And what this, uh, what dawned on us was then that these channels that Leopold Woolman and Miller thought were adjusted and natural and in sync with their floodplains really weren't. They were actually incised into uh, anthropogenically elevated floodplains. And so the idea that the, um, the channel only uh, overtops maybe uh, two years out of three, uh, the idea that the bankful discharge is about the two year return period event was really called into question by this paper. But also they pointed out that 
Before European settlements, the streams were small and a branching channels with extensive vegetated wetlands, nothing like the rather dry and well-drained floodplains um, that Leopold Woolman and Miller thought were natural. So that started uh, me and uh, Brian Kluwer um, looking at uh, rivers around the world. And what we noticed more and more was that uh, not many of them were actually single thread meandering. Uh, in fact, they were all, um, uh, the, the ones that hadn't been uh, heavily impacted were rather similar to what Walter and Merritt's talked about as uh, being um, multiple channels with extensive wetlands. And we just see some examples here of big rivers um, that have not been engineered. And you'll notice that none of them has a single thread channel uh, and all of them have um, much more complex plan forms. Now, uh, particularly in Europe, um, we don't see many rivers like that anymore. Here's a picture of uh, a map of the Rhine in 1963, and you can see it's a single thread meandering river. Well, you know, that's, that's uh, what we expect, isn't it? But let's rewind to 1872. And of course, at that time, it had many, many side channels. And if we go back a little bit further to 1828, it was a fully anastomose system. And the reason it's not like that anymore is largely thanks to this chap, uh, got, uh, Johann Gottfried Tuller, a brilliant engineer, who found the river when he, uh, when he got there as uh, an immense network of interconnecting streams, coves, and marshy hollows, um, and concluded that no river, uh, stream or river, not even the Rhine, requires more than one riverbed. And that kind of uh, view of the river, that the river really only needs one channel, uh, has become pervasive um, in all the parts of the world that Europeans have, have influenced. It's, it's rippled out um, from uh, the 19th century. But whilst I was on sabbatical leave in uh, California in 2008, um, I flew around quite a bit in Brian's light aircraft. Brian um, Kluwer is a, a, a private pilot. And as we flew around the West, we noticed more and more that actually uh, in the parts of the, the, the valleys that hadn't been ditched for ranching or agriculture, these multi-channel wetland uh, corridors were, were pretty um, ubiquitous. And as we looked into the literature in Europe and in the Eastern U.S., Walter and Merritt's I've just talked about, in California, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, um, we found lots of other people had noticed that too. And that led us to respectfully revisit the channel evolution model. Uh, and we did that in uh, 2013 uh, in a paper published in River uh, Research and Applications. And in that paper, we started, of course, with stage one, uh, what uh, Shumharvey and Watson thought was the undisturbed natural stream. But we suspected that actually that wasn't the beginning of the story. Um, the, the single thread stream is actually already somewhat incised. And so we wanted to bring in a prior condition, which was truly undisturbed. But on the other hand, we didn't want to upset the numbering system too much because that was really well established in the literature and in people's minds. So what do we do to get over the fact that we want something before stage one? in the CEM. Well, here um, my background as a Brit came into play because if you look at an American elevator on the left, you'll see that the first um, button, uh, the ground floor, is floor one. In the UK, that wouldn't be the case. In the UK, uh, in the, uh, the lift, um, you see that the ground floor is floor zero. And so that um, a kind of light came on um, that, ah, what comes before stage one? Stage zero. And it's as simple as that. That's where the term, com term comes from. So we put in prior to the Shum, Harvey and Watson stage one, a stage zero, which is an anastomosing wet woodland, or it might be an anastomosing grass, grass wetland, depending on the, um, the context, the biome, uh, within which the river's situated. We then said, yep, you can go um, straight to stage three, 
that's the uh, incised and, um, and widening stage. Or actually, you can often go through a stage two that is a channelized um, condition where somebody comes through and straightens the river or they uh, re cross section it into a rectangular form. Um, and that's what kicks off the incision. So the incision can happen either within the uh, stage one stream or in, uh, or it can be uh, triggered by, by um, engineering. In either case, you go into this sort of down and out stage of degradation and rapid widening. And in fact, work by Brian Bledsoe in California showed that many streams go into that phase and then get stuck. We called that arrested degradation. And it happens where the banks become pretty unerodable, uh, either because of um, their lithology, you get into some really stiff materials or um, cemented materials that won't erode, uh, or because the banks are stabilized artificially. And, and that's a pretty sad condition for a river if it gets into that arrested degradation uh, stage. Um, we've called it, uh, the, they're kind of zombie rivers because they look at, look like natural streams, but they're as dead as a nail. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, however, if we don't get stuck, then we go into the um, aggradation and widening stage where material starts to accumulate at the foot of the banks. And eventually we get back to a quasi equilibrium cross section. And that's where Shum, Harvey and Watson stopped. However, uh, I stayed on in North Mississippi after they'd gone back to Colorado and noticed a late stage evolution whereby that uh, new inset bankful channel becomes asymmetrical and starts to push out the shoulders of the incised canyon within which it's nested. And eventually, if that goes on long enough, then the canyon's widened enough that it can accommodate again a multi-channel anastomose system with a wet woodland or a um, grass wetland. So that's the stream evolution model. We also went from a sort of linear layout that Shum, Harvey and Watson had used to a, to a, a circle or actually a spiral, um, which illustrates how it's possible for at any of these stages, a short circuit to take place. And so it's possible for a stage one to go back to being a stage zero. It's possible for a stage three to go back to being a stage one if conditions um, dictate. And also the circle make it, makes it clear that there are two axes to channel evolution, or if you like stream uh, evolution, the vertical one, aggradation, degradation, the horizontal one, narrowing and widening. And we can see how they uh, impact the different stages, uh, depending on which, which one's dominant, whether it's aggradation, degradation, or narrowing or widening. The other um, novel part of the stream evolution model is that Brian Kluwer, uh, with his background in fisheries and, and uh, wildlife, brought in a series of pie charts to represent the hydrogeomorphic attributes of the channel in its different stages and the habitat and ecosystem benefits that it's able to support. And the diameter of the pie chart is the, uh, is, represents the abundance of these attributes and benefits and the pieces of the pie chart indicate the diversity of different um, features and uh, benefits that exist. And what you can see is a pretty clear um, diversion, uh, division here uh, between uh, stages 0, 1, 6, 7 and 8 and stages 3, 4 and 5 uh, and especially stage 2 um, with the, the, uh, the latter being really pretty meager in terms of um, attributes and benefits and the, uh, the former um, being uh, much, much richer and more diverse. And in terms then of restoration targets, um, targets of stage zero, stage eight, even seven, um, and at a push uh, one or six are really pretty good in terms of supporting uh, ecosystem and species recovery. If we're restoring um, to conditions uh, of, of three, four, and five, um, that's pretty bad because we are 
um, setting our sights far too low uh, for restoration. We're, we're rather um, underachieving. And if we ever um, stabilize channels to the point that they're either channelized or in arrest, an arrested degradation uh, condition, um, that's just ugly. So let me move on to try and um, give you the idea that, that all of this, whilst it's based on this channel evolution model, on the uh, stream evolution model, um, it does have a basis in theory. Many, many river restorers are fully acquainted with the idea of uh, the importance of the bankfall discharge as the design discharge for a restoration project. And indeed, it's, it's generally accepted, I think, in, in restoration practice uh, that bankful stage and discharge are key restoration design factors. And I'm, I'm not going to uh, attack that. I'm just going to try and uh, broaden out our thinking about um, how bankful stage and how the effective discharge um, change depending on whether you're in a transport reach um, or in a response reach. And response reaches are uh, reaches where the sediment supply is bigger than the sediment transport capacity, uh, whereas a transport reach, the sediment supply is equal to the sediment transport capacity. And that's the condition under which uh, Wallman and Miller developed the idea that the bankful discharge is about one and a half or the two year event, because that's the flow doing most sediment transport. Um, in this fa famous diagram, where curve one is the flow duration curve, curve two is the sediment um, rating curve, and curve three is um, the uh, collective sediment discharge, with the flow doing most transport uh, being uh, about the one and a half or maybe the two year event. And I'm not going to kick down that sandcastle. What I am going to point out is that that's for a transport reach. In Shum's um, characterization of the uh, of the basin as being uh, source reaches where sediment comes into the system in the headwaters, the transfer zone in the middle reaches, and the response zone where the sediment is deposited in the lower reaches. Um, that applies to transport reaches where sediment input equals sediment output. Very often when we're talking about fully reconnected floodplains, we're talking about response reaches because these reaches uh, gain sediment through time. That's how the floodplain gets built. And they need sediment added to them because the sediment within the floodplains is, is always compacting and consolidating, such that if you don't keep it topped up with fresh sediment, your, your um, floodplain sinks uh, and, and turns into a, to a swamp. And I went back to a paper by my PhD supervisor, Richard Hay at UEA in, in England. Um, it's a paper I think is really good, but it doesn't get cited much back from 1979, where he took the bankful discharge concept and applied it to streams that aren't in equilibrium, where the sediment input doesn't equal the sediment output. Now, the base case where the sediment input and the output are the same, that, that is, there's only one type two curve there. There's only one sediment raising curve, the same for the sediment input and the output. Indeed, you find that the flow doing most transport is the effective flow, and it's the flow to which we would expect the bankful dimensions of the channel to adjust. But if we think of a condition where sediment input is bigger than sediment output, which is exactly what we're talking about with a fully connected floodplain system and an active floodplain, well, that's no longer the case, because now the flow that has the most influence on the landscape is not the flow doing most transport, it's the flow doing most deposition. And the flow doing most deposition is defined by the difference between the cumulative sediment input curve and the cumulative sediment output curve, the two curve threes. And that flow, the flow doing most deposition, is quite a bit lower than the flow doing most transport. Yet it is the one that dictates the forms of the channels or channel or channels. And indeed, um, what we see then is that in reaches with fully connected floodplains, the channels are smaller than they would be in a transport reach. 
So bankful theory doesn't not work. It's just a bit more complicated um, because you're not in reaches where sediment input equals sediment output. What constrains where those reaches are? Well, primarily, and of course, lots and lots of things, but primarily the valley confinement. Um, and Schum and Rosgin and Briley and Friars and Wheaton and many others have pointed out that if you have a very confined and constrained valley bottom, then you tend to get single thread rivers um, where they're geologically controlled. If you have semi-controlled or moderately entrenched or partially confined, confined channels, um, they usually meander. But if you've got truly alluvial channels where the valley walls are not constraining the planform, then you find multiple channels, anabranch channels, uh, anastomose channels. And that valley confinement, of course, may be the result of many things. It may be the geology, but it may be alluvial fans that are jutting out into the valley and narrowing it. It may be um, terraces left over from glacial epochs. For, for many reasons, then, the, the degree of valley confinement and confining features vary along the course of the river. And it was pointed out by Briley and Friars that valley confinement is a primary control on many fluvial geomorphic processes that occur on and along the valley bottoms. And the downstream sequence of valley settings is a key control on longitudinal patterns of hydrology and sediment flux, as well as dictating uh, river types. So we can characterize that variability in valley confinement uh, as producing beads on a string. Um, we see areas where we are constrained to a single thread channel, but then if we take those out, we can see the areas where we're not constrained to having a single channel. We can have an anabranched or uh, an astomosing system. And in some cases, of course, it's very obvious where we have a, a meadow valley that's wide and has plenty, is a, a big canvas for the river to work on, and where the geology nips, it, nips in and prevents that from happening. Although, as you look at more and more rivers, and Paul Powers will talk about this, um, often the floodplains are ribbons rather than beads on a string. Um, the floodplain may narrow, but actually very rarely gets, um, gets nipped out completely. And finally then, what about stable channel design? What about stable channels? Well, for for decades, lanes balance has been a, you know, a, a way to characterize um, the balance between the discharge and the slope of, of the channel against its sediment load and its sediment caliber. And the aim has been to center this needle to avoid incision and aggradation at all costs. But if we look at Shum's classification of dynamic, dynamically stable river platforms, we see actually there's quite a lot to it. And based on the plan form, the width depth ratio, the stream power, the uh, bed load to total load ratio, the type of sediment load, the type of sediment size, we can get a lot of different um, dynamically stable plan forms. There's been a great emphasis and a great um, focus on the single thread meandering channel, but that's only one of many potentially stable channel forms. And indeed, when we go to a, um, a stable channel design method, like the Copeland method developed by the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the tendency is uh, uh, to, to look for um, a stable channel design at the bottom of this Nike swoosh, where the slope is minimized and, uh, and the meandering um, is defined by the difference between the channel slope and the valley slope. And that's sort of printed through into restoration design, that the optimum channel then is a single thread meandering channel. But of course, anywhere on the Nike swoosh is potentially dynamically stable. We could have a single uh, straight channel if it's steeper. You could have a braided channel if you wanted, but it would have to be steeper in order to uh, match the flow resistance and the sediment transport capacity. And you could certainly have a multi-threaded anastomo system. So we've just been kind of predator locked onto single thread meandering when other stable platforms are available. And what's different about these, I would say, is the degree of confinement, whether it's a source or a transport reach or a response reach, 
And that opens up then, yes, we can have straight or meandering channels, but we can also, if we want, have braided, island braided, and anastomose channels. And they'll all meet the criteria for dynamic stability. What's different about those channels is the influence of biology. And you can sort of see that in Shum's sketches where they get greener towards the bottom right hand corner. And we know that we can achieve that. Um, we can achieve um, a change in plant form just through biology alone. When beaver colonize an incised stream and turn it into a beaver meadow, they, by their own actions, tip Lane's balance. And we can see that on the stream triangle in terms of biological uplift of braided rivers into anastomose channels. So I'll conclude with just one slide from um, Jonathan Phillips, uh, University of Kentucky, who looked on the Cumberland Plateau at the balance between the energy, and energy is what gets things done on this planet, um, the energy available to drive erosion, deposition, and to drive the biological ecosystem. And it really is no context. The solar powered ecosystem has energy that dwarfs geophysical energy by six orders of magnitude. It's not even close. And if only a tiny percentage of that energy is available for doing work on the river, uh, it will still mean that biology is a major influence on channel forms. And when we move from the single thread in size channel to the fully connected multi-channel system, we give that biology a chance to do its work on the landscape uh, to the benefit of us all. Thank you very much.